as my spiritual path to Barra May Bad Karunga. Um, thanks. Unfortunately, that's the extent of my Hindi. Uh, <laughs> For the English speakers, I'm Dave Hall, and today I'll be speaking about deploying Drupal 8. So, who am I? I'm an IT consultant. I've been running my own business for over 15 years. Um, I've been playing around with Drupal since the days of 4.6, and um, I've been heavily focused on deployment and managing Drupal at scale since the days of Drupal 6 where I deployed over 2,000 sites for a single client in 51 to 52 hours. Um, that was a crazy project. Um, I, I enjoy hacking on web apps not only um, with Drupal or PHP but other languages and I also do sysadmin work. Um, I get bored doing the same thing for too long, so that's why I do all kinds of different things. So I'll start by running through some of the things I like. Obviously, I'm here, so I like Drupal. I also like automation. Um, if I can get a person out of a process, then it makes me happy. I also love uh, DrupalCon. This event has been amazing. I've really enjoyed it so far. I also love cricket and I love the Mumbai Indians. I've actually been lucky enough to go see two games. Um, I've actually seen Harbhajan Singh bowl and Sachin Tendulkar um, bat on uh, Wankhede. Um, so I'm pretty happy about that. But what makes me even happier about cricket is when Australia wins the World Cup <laughs> and that's going to happen again next month. So let's look at deploying Drupal 8. So um, here we go, this is just a very simple deployment. We've downloaded it from Drupal.org, we're FTPing it to DreamHost and um, I've sped it up just a little bit. Um, and here we go, um, we start going through doing the basic configuration, put in database credentials and so on. And then the installer runs. And then we put in the site name and all of that stuff. And we even struggled to find our own time zone. And then we save it. There we go. That's Drupal 8 deployed. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs> That's the end of my presentation. Now, that's what most people think deployment is with Drupal. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is everything else that goes around deployment so you can have successful, repeatable deployments for your sites and your client's sites. And I'm going to do that um, by telling you a story. Actually, not quite that story. Whoops. Um, so once upon a time, there was a company my clicker's not working too well. All right, let's skip the clicker. There was a company called Acme Corporation. I don't know if any of you have heard of Acme Corporation. Um, they, um, they had a very loyal customer, Mr. Wiley Coyote, and um, he used to buy all kinds of stuff from them. Um, very successful business, um, very innovative with their products. But they had a few problems with their existing content management system. So they started looking at um, how they could improve their web presence. And this is Larry. I mean, sorry, not Larry, Gary. They look very similar, but this is actually Gary. Um, and Gary is a developer at Acme Corporation. And he likes playing around with new things. So um, Gary installed Drupal locally. Um, here he is setting up XAMPP. Now, you're probably all going, yeah, we've all set up XAMPP. I did on my first day at my new job, it's so boring. Yes, it is boring, but it's how most people get a local development environment set up. Um, XAMPP is really good for when you get started, but as we progress through things today, you'll learn that there are alternatives to give you a more consistent um, environment. And, uh, cool, actually, I should turn the firewall off. 
Oh, I can't do that. All right, hopefully it doesn't trigger again. All right, so um, here we are. We're just running through doing the um, doing the deployment, uh, doing the configuration. It's all very exciting. Once again, I've sped the uh, video up and downloading from drupal.org again, putting in all of our details. Now, the, the problem with XAMPP is a lot of people use XAMPP on a Windows environment, but how many people here actually deploy onto Windows servers? Anyone deploy onto Windows servers? Okay, you have my sympathies. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the thing is that the Windows environment and a Linux server environment are completely different. You need consistency between your environments. So that's why XAMPP isn't uh, such a good idea. But we'll just wait for this to run through. Well, actually, we know what's going to happen. Let's skip the rest of the video. It's a bit dull. OK. So Gary goes to his boss, Ada, and says to Ada, hey, um, check out Drupal. And she's like, that looks great. Let's, let's go with it. So they build their first site, and they launch it. And the, the launch goes like this. It, it was amazing. They were very happy with it. Then Amy, not Angie, but Amy from marketing came along. And she said, how many people are visiting the site? And Gary's like, I don't know. So then um, they had to work out, uh, like Gary had to sit down and do some research and figure out how they would get um, some traffic data. And Gary had a poke around on the server and went, here, we've got Apache logs. You can go through that and figure out your, um, how many visitors we're having. Um, you might guess Amy wasn't too happy with that. So they decided to use uh, an analytics package. And there's lots of analytics packages around. Google Analytics is the most popular. PyWick is an open source equivalent. Um, if you've got heaps of money and love throwing it away, you can give it to Adobe and get Omniture. And then you've got tools like Chartbeat, which allow you to um, do real-time uh, user tracking. One of the good things that your um, analytics will show you is all kinds of data, but also page load times. And we can see here that in this one particular week, the average page load time almost doubled. Now, you need to be watching your data. It's not just, oh, we'll do the analytics and we'll send off to marketing and they're like, oh, wow, our latest social media campaign was great. We um, increased traffic by 10%. As developers, you should be trying to get access to the analytics data and understanding the traffic patterns, the page load times, all of that stuff, so you have some idea what that looks like. Um, and Ada had a look at the logs and went to Gary and said, why are there gaps in the logs? And at first Gary's like, oh, I don't know. And then he had a look at the, the traffic logs and there was gaps there as well. And then they realized that because they were using um, cheap hosting, that the site kept on going down. And how they found that out was by using uptime monitoring. So by using a tool like Pingdom or Wormly, or um, New Relic has real-time user um, tracking as well. That allows you to actually identify um, if the server's up and down and it'll send you alerts, which is kind of useful, especially if the site is, like if it's your personal blog, you might think, oh, it's not really worth it. But if the site's generating um, revenue either through e-commerce or by um, generating foot traffic in stores and stuff, then you, you'll want to um, fix that. So Ada said, we need better hosting. And, you know, Gary's a bit old school. He thought GoDaddy was still pretty cool. Um, I kind of think Gary may not have a job for much longer. Uh, <laughs> but they, they decided to go for a platform as a service option. So, um, Platform as a service, rather than just giving you um, the hardware, they give you a bunch of tooling around the system as well. So you get version control. Um, 
Ideally, it's Git. Um, how many people here have to use um, Subversion? Okay, you're also people I feel sorry for. I noticed some overlap between the we deploy to Windows and the we use Subversion. Um, but at least using Subversion is better than using no version control. So um, the PASS um, services, they should give you multiple environments. So you can actually have a dev, a stage and a prod rather than deploying all changes directly to production. Um, that's a great way to break sites. And they should also offer automated deployment. So when you commit your code, that the changes actually go live um, on an environment for you rather than you having to FTP it or kick off manual processes. And generally, they'll give you a service level agreement. So if it does go down, you've got someone to choke. Um, and hopefully, if you're losing money, they're losing money because you don't have to pay them. Um, now, Ada was really impressed with the new hosting platform. And Gary started thinking, what else can we improve? So they decided to adopt a composer-based workflow. How many people here have used Composer? Oh, that's great. Um, I'm not going to give you people any symphony, you, uh, any sympathy. Uh, <laughs> symphony, symphony. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, you can have lots of symphony, just no sympathy. Um, so yeah, the um, composer-based workflow makes it so you actually contain, uh, you put a lot less stuff in your Git repo. So what we've got here is a simple um, composer.json file that specifies all of our dependencies. So we've got Drupal core, we've got Drush, and we've got Drupal console. If you've got a Composer JSON file and it doesn't have Drupal console in there, then you're doing it wrong. For Drupal 8, you really want to have console in there as well as Drush. Now, um, this, this stops you, um, like when you've got one big Git repo, you've got a tight deadline and it's like all the code is in there and one thing isn't working, so we'll just hack core today and next week we won't be so busy and we'll fix it. Six months later, that hack is still in production. You do an upgrade and then the functionality breaks. Whereas if you've got a composer file, you're specifying all of your dependencies there and your changes should be properly tested and you know exactly what you're running. So it makes, it, um, it makes the separation of the, the dependencies and um, your custom code a lot cleaner. Um, so this is a little video of using a composer-based workflow for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, sorry, that text, this is a pre-recorded video, unfortunately, and the text is a little bit, probably more than a little bit blurry for the people up the back. Um, so I'll talk through it. What we're doing is we're adding the devel module as a dependency to the composer.json, which um, I'll add in here and we'll put in the, um, the, um, the branch that we're using. Now, I would love to show this in real time, but you'll see when we get to um, the composer update step that it would be a quarter of my talk just sitting here waiting for composer to finish updating all the dependencies, which is, um, it does slow things down a little bit with using composer, but you do have the benefit of um, having that separation. So I've made the change. I'm now running um, composer, um, composer Update to update all my dependencies. And I cheated here. I sped the video up a bit. Um, and so then this will run. And it, it's pulling down all the different dependencies. So we've got PHP unit coming in. Um, we've got the devel module coming in here, and so on. So we'll give this a sec. <coughs> so 
All right, if any of you want to have a nap, I'll let you know when it's time to wake up. Um, come on. Okay, so that's finished. And then we, we can have a look and see our changes. Um, so we, um, the other thing, because um, this is done, I'm actually using platform.sh for my demo here. It gives me a lot of integration here. So once I'm done, all I do is run platform local build and it will actually go and deploy that all into my Drupal VM local environment so I can continue to work with this code if I want to. Um, the platform SH guys are here. If you have a chance, go talk to them, check out their stuff. I'm very impressed with their stuff at the moment. Um, so now this is, um, well, hang on, I've got a, um, so it shows the, the two files that have changed. We're pretending that I've tested this locally just for um, doing it a bit quicker. And then I'll um, add the files. Actually, I'll diff them first. So we can see our change has gone into the composer file. And these are all the dependencies that have been updated as well. Super exciting reading diff files for hashes that have updated. Um, so now we'll do the git commit. Now for some reason it stopped echoing the command output but we'll, um, we'll do the git commit. And Okay, so we've committed the files, now we'll push them, and then we'll go have a look at what shows up. So we, if we have a look, you can see here in progress, it's already happened on platform.sh, and here it's actually rebuilding my environment on platform sh for me. So we'll switch back over there in a sec. Come on, person who recorded the video, switch. <coughs> All right, that was a bad edit. Um, okay, so now I've switched. Um, and here's, here's the site as it stands at the moment. We will um, we'll just use a Drush ULI link because I always forget my credentials. So we'll log in and now we'll jump to our modules page and we'll scroll down and we'll scroll down. Thank you. <laughs> and scroll back up so we can find it. There we go, there's our devel module. So that, that's been all handled by Composer and the automation has gone and deployed that for us. So that's, um, that's how quick and easy when you've got a platform that actually supports Composer-based workflows, you just com com commit the Composer files and it goes and deploys it for you. Uh, all right, so the, the next thing is um, performance metrics. Um, one of the things that, when, once you've got a site that's live, you should be regularly looking at how your site performs because the, the thing is, you want to know where the bottlenecks are in the site. You shouldn't be waiting for the site to go down before you realise where the bottlenecks are. And there's a bunch of really good tools for this stuff. Um, there's Blackfire, the guys are um, next to the Platform SH guys here downstairs, if you want to talk to them. There's also New Relic. New Relic um, I use for um, quite a few sites. And New Relic gives us nice little graphs like this. So this is showing me that the average response time for the server is like 250 milliseconds, but I don't know what happened yesterday, but yeah, something, something wasn't too good. Um, <laughs> And we can see that the, um, the user experience wasn't so good either. You, you really want it in the blue with it dipping down into the green occasionally. If you're dipping down 
below um, this orange line, that shows that your customers are going to get frustrated. Um, and this is also showing um, how many requests per minute. This site's not doing many, it's only doing 10 per minute. Um, so, but one of the things that I tell people about using tools like New Relic is don't just wait until you've got a problem and go in there and start clicking around going, can I find where the problem is? You need to be in here regularly understanding what your individual sites look like. Where, because you, know, you might have a nightly cron job that causes a, um, a spike in database load. But if you know that that happens every night at 3 a.m. and no one's, um, no one's really on the site at that time, then that's not going to be a big problem. But if you're noticing that a, a particular page is causing five or six second page load times, then that's something that you should dig into. But understanding what your graphs normally look like helps you uh, recognise where the problems are. If you're just going in when there's a problem, then you're going to miss the, the key problems in these graphs. Um, another thing that um, you should look at doing is um, visit Drupal VM, and I actually didn't put the domain in there. Um, so uh, DrupalVM.com, it's a Vagrant, how many people here use Vagrant for local development? That's awesome. Um, I wasn't expecting there to be so many. That's great. Um, now, this time for all of you who didn't put your hands up, you have my sympathies. Um, so um, Vagrant allows you to run a virtual machine that gets provisioned with um, consistent configuration. And Drupal VM allows you to set up uh, an environment that um, you can um, take the, the stuff that Jeff Gerling has already um, built and you can use it as is or customise it so it closely replicates your environment. If you're deploying onto Acquia hosting, um, he actually has a configuration that replicates the Acquia hosting environment. Um, so this allows you to debug things locally and have it as close as possible to your production environments, which is a lot better than running XAMPP. So all the people before who had their hands up for XAMPP, um, you should check out Drupal VM. Another thing um, they did was go for a regular release schedule. Initially they decided once a month and it was the second Tuesday of every month and that worked well. It gave them some consistency with their deployments. Um, but then Amy from marketing came along and said, how can I stage content changes? Because the code stuff's all working pretty well with the new platform, but content changes, it wasn't so good. All that um, Gary could suggest was manual copying, and that was causing all kinds of problems for them. Um, you know, pages were being missed, links were breaking because the title wasn't copied exactly, and all kinds of stuff. It was hell. But then Gary found the deploy module. Um, how many people here have used deploy? Yes. Good work. Um, I like seeing those hands go up. Um, now, for those of you who haven't used the deploy module, or if you haven't heard of the deploy module, um, today, 4 p.m., Hall 31, go check out using deploy in Drupal 8 with Dick Olson, Tim Millwood, and I've forgotten Abhishek's um, last name. Are any of those guys here? Anand Yeah, um, that's him. Um, <laughs> um, any of the guys doing that presentation here? Okay, good. I don't need to go to their presentation today then. <laughs> All right. So then um, our, another thing we need to deal with is configuration. Configuration has changed in Drupal 8. I think most of us who have been dealing with configuration in Drupal 7 have been working with the features module, which Features is great, but there's a lot of problems with features at the same time. It's only great because we didn't have an alternative. Whereas Drupal 8, we've got CMI. Now, CMI, um, 
It means we don't have to pass around database with our configuration code and all of that, um, not code, content and configuration all kind of mashed up together. Um, now, we can do UI imports for configuration. The, the problem with doing a UI um, import is that we can't have a fully automated deployment. Like, say you're doing a deployment in, well, you shouldn't deploy Friday afternoon unless you've got an um, automated delivery pipeline. So say you're delivering, uh, deploying first thing Monday morning, the developer had a big weekend, they kick off the, the content um, and code deployment, but they forget to do the, um, do the config import then you've got wrong configuration on your site and you'll have trouble. So I, I strongly recommend that you use Drush and um, I'm, I'll take you through a workflow that I'm advocating people use for Drupal 8. Um, again, I'm sorry for the people up the back. Um, I should have made the, the console bigger. But what I'm doing here is um, so I'm going to export the configuration. So I run config export and provide a destination path if I don't make typos. Um, so we'll give this a sec because I do keep on making typos. Um, and so this is exporting it to a directory in my git repo. And so um, I've got two directories here, base and dev. Um, now base is my base site configuration. That applies across all of my environments. And then I also have, um, so if we do, um, if we have a look, here's all the YAML files with all of the configuration for my site. Now I'll commit that change. And so that's gone and added all of those files. Now I'll update the slogan. Now, um, what I did here was export the configuration when I shouldn't have. I um, redid the video this morning and um, I should have done it yesterday. Um, but now if we do a git status, we see that this file here has updated. We do a diff and it'll show our configuration changes. Um, if you can read that, but you can see there's red and green that indicates that you know it's changed. Now ignore me trying to import the configuration that I've written to disk that matches here. That of course won't make any change. We'll just um, wait for this bit. Also, if anyone here knows how to put proper video controls in a revealed JS um, presentation, come see me after this. I'd love to know. Um, so, um, so what we see here is we've got our um, configuration where we're providing the source directory. This isn't going to work because I'm being an idiot. Um, just pretend this is like a real live demo where the presenter always makes mistakes. I had to include that so the video seemed real. Um, you know, you don't want an over polished video. Okay, so now we're, we're back to the site. Um, we can see that we've got the, the slogan and we've got the site name. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to set the site name to dev site, save the configuration. And now what I'm going to do is do a, um, a configuration get to select just one piece of configuration. So I do drush c get, then I need the name, which is system.site, and that actually exports the YAML. Now I redirect that output to a directory. I've got a blog post about this on my blog. Um, with uh, the actual details for those of you up the back who can't read what's on the screen. Um, 
And so this will actually export the um, just that single piece of configuration. So if we do a git status, we say that it's just dev. I'll, I'll add that and we'll commit it. And you'll see when the commit happens, it's just one file, whereas before there was a mountain of files. Come on. OK, cool. So I've added the dev. I'll do the um, commit. OK, so now I've got, I've got stuff in base and I've got stuff in dev. So we do the, um, now we'll actually revert the, the name change that was here before. <coughs> Okay, so now we've got our repo back the way we want it. And what we'll do is we'll actually do an import because at the moment this is our config. We've got dev site and the slogan. And so now we'll import our base config, which we'll go back and have a look at once it finishes importing. Sometimes I feel like Drupal 8 should be called Drupal wait because you've got to wait for composer, wait for configuration import. It's like, wait, wait, wait. Okay, so now we will refresh this page and here we go. So that was a bit fast, but we've got the, the stuff the way we wanted it. And now we'll do, a, we're importing from dev, but we're specifying partial, which tells it that it's a partial uh, thing of configuration and it's back to reading dev site. So that's, that's how we can have multiple environment configuration. So when you're automating stuff, because you might want um, something different in your configuration from one environment to another. Um, so, cool. No. Hang on. <coughs> Um, where are No, I don't want that. Shut up. I actually killed Chrome so you wouldn't see how many tabs I had open. Then I clicked the wrong thing. All right. So um, now, oh no. <laughs> okay, cool. Now we're back on track. All right. Um, so I should disable rescue time next time I present too. I thought I killed everything. Okay. Um, actually, side plug. Um, rescue time's really good for seeing where you waste time during your day. Um, so um, now Ada's asking, um, can we make faster releases? And Gary's like, mm, I don't know. Like, you know, releases are a bit problematic for us. Every time we do a new release, there's new bugs. How many times has people heard that from like managers and stuff that you can't release more often because every time there's a release, there's more bugs? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I know a couple of managers who push that line. <laughs> Not looking at anyone. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the issues with long release cycles is long fix times. It actually takes quite a while to get your fix through. Smaller releases actually have less risk because you're making less changes. It also means that you can make, you can get your fixes in faster. So, you know, Gary thought, well, what's it going to take to be able to do more frequent releases? So a, a really key thing is automated testing, using PHP unit for your backend stuff and Bahat for checking that the behavior of the site is as expected. Excuse me, one of the good things about using Bahat over like Selenium, like Selenium's great, but trying to get a business person to understand Selenium is hard. You can't go, here's our Git repo with all of our Selenium tests, it's going to verify stuff. They'll be like, oh yeah, that's great, but how do I know that? Whereas if they can actually read through the Bahat tests, it gives them a clear idea of um, what you're testing for and what to expect. So continuous integration 
is a really key part of this. So having automated stuff that um, does your merges, does your testing, all of that stuff. Um, Jenkins is really good. I've used Jenkins for six years, maybe longer, um, back when it was still Hudson. Um, Travis is one of the new cool kids on the block. Um, there's quite a few Drupal projects using Travis. There's also a paid private version if you want to use that. Circle CI has also got some traction in the Drupal community. I need to play with it. Codechip's pretty good. Not so suited for Drupal, but still a, a great product. And there's a bunch of others out there. Like I'm plugging products today that I'm familiar with, and um, I would have um, I would happily consider using on my own projects. But there's a bunch of other stuff out there I've never tried, so you know it still could be good. Just because I don't have it up here doesn't mean it's um, you shouldn't use it. Now this is um, I thought I'd use one of um, Dick Olson's projects to show off Travis. Um, to win some brownie points, but it didn't turn up, so I shouldn't have used his. Ah, okay, still no excuse. Um, so what, what this is showing is that it's run the tests and it, it can actually run it against multiple versions of um, PHP and multiple versions of Drupal. So this is running PHP 5.5 with Drupal 8.0.x and then PHP 5.5 with Drupal 8.1.x and the same um, with um, PHP 5.6. So if um, you're in a situation where your hosting vendor is um, changing from one PHP version to another, you can start running tests in parallel with the two different versions to make it easier to transition. Um, it'd be really nice to have uh, PHP 7 as a target and have that up on there as well. Um, now, I, I really think that your absolute maximum release cycle for doing um, code changes should be once a week for a site that's under active development. Now, some of you, your project managers will just have nightmares if you go back and say, hey, we should do weekly releases. It, it's not going to be a, like, go from we're doing releases every six weeks to doing a release every week overnight. You need to get these things in place. But once you get into the habit of doing weekly releases, people get more confidence around the release. And yeah, sure, you're going to have bugs. Things may break occasionally, but if you're in, in the practice of releasing um, once a week, once a day, once an hour, um, then you know you can make those changes. You can fix things quicker, and it'll actually make your team go faster. And also, people from um, marketing and management and stuff like that, they can see what you're producing, and they can say we don't like th this bit or that bit. And you can make those um, adjustments quicker. So it actually makes your team um, able to deliver to meet the business needs a lot faster. Another really key thing is communication. Now, one thing I don't have up here is um, a recommendation on a ticketing system because I tolerate JIRA and hate just about everything else. Um, so we, um, the communication stuff, um, we should, like you should have a wiki. If you're using GitHub, who here has used the wiki feature on GitHub for project documentation? Okay, good. Um, like, if I come back and do this talk again, I hope to see a lot more hands go up. I, I really like the GitHub wiki system for project docs. Um, Google Docs is also good, but it doesn't support Markdown, so it's not so easy to work with. Um, but it is easier to put pictures in. Um, another really important communication thing is real-time chat. Um, I, these days, I could not do my job properly without Slack. Um, you know, it, it just makes such a difference. You can have notifications coming in from different systems. You can have all kinds of stuff being centralized into chat, which helps give a lot more visibility, not only to your team, but to other people as well. So I, 
Um, if you get the chance, have a play with Slack. Um, HipChat is good, um, doesn't um, have quite the, the interest and the integrations these days as Slack does. Slack pretty much came from nowhere and now dominates chat. Um, and you know, if you really get stuck, start burning furniture in the office and do smoke signals to communicate with other people. Um, actually, um, I think the lawyers um, won't be happy if you start burning the furniture, so please don't do that and don't sue me if you do. Um, another thing you should look at building is dashboards to expose data to management. Um, you know, what, um, what's the team's velocity look like? What, um, what's coming up? What's been dealt with? How's the site performing? Provide all this data to people, expose it and allow um, people to see what's actually happening with the site rather than all they see is go to the website, oh, it feels slow or, you know, I don't like um, this or can you make the logo 20% bigger because, you know, the logo is always too small. Um, also, status pages, um, you can build those for internal consumption only if you want to track how um, things are running. But really importantly, what I real the the real message from today is embrace change. Like this needs to be an iterative process. Like you can't just like go, okay, um, we're going to um, do this tomorrow and have it all work perfectly. You're going to have to reiterate just like you do with code. It's also why I didn't come in and go, this is the one perfect way to do deployments. I'm giving, I hope I've given you all some idea of some of the things you can integrate into your workflows to make it so you can deploy Drupal more successfully. And I hope that I can use um, one of my friends to actually help um, give you some idea of um, what this stuff's like. So you won't get it right the first time. When you first start off, you're going to be like the guys in this Jeep. Oh, hang on, we need audio. <laughs> stuff right, you too can be seen. is my favourite Bollywood scene. I love that clip. All right. So, Danyavald and the English speakers, thank you. Um, I've had a bit of fun doing today's presentation. Um, I hope there's a few questions or else we're going to finish a bit early. And, um, yeah, well... Um, while we're going through this, feel free to um, follow me on Twitter. Um, things on Twitter get a bit crazy with me sometimes, but you know that's the way it goes. And um, if you want a bit more serious, um, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Any questions?
different projects all the time. There are many projects which are like a couple of months or a quarter. Uh, do you really recommend using this even in those projects? Um, so, um, there is some overhead for setting this stuff up, but um, I don't know, like, do you work at, um, do you work for an agency or do you work freelance? Sorry? Freelancing? Agency. Uh, agency, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so, like, one of the things that I think um, a lot of clients can benefit from is agencies actually investing in these processes um, now, some clients are um, lucky enough to be big enough that they can go to the, the agency and say, you're going to follow our way of working. But it's my understanding that you know, most clients um, like go to the agency and they're like, oh, we just want a site and you, know, you guys build it. Whereas if you've got these processes in place that you use for all of your projects or 90% of your projects, um, even though there is some setup cost, you can actually spread that setup cost across a, a year's worth of clients. Just tack a bit extra on the bill, and the client will actually see a higher quality outcome each time because of that investment. So, uh, let's say even if they are ready to pay. Yep. But, uh, like it's a couple of months site that is it's going on live in a couple of months. You are not probably going to have a support contract. Still, it's worth investing this time. I think it is because what you can do, um, one of the things I didn't cover today is I actually think that with your deployment stuff, you should be planning that when you're planning your content types, when you're getting the wireframes done. Deployment is just another um, thing that needs to be planned and built out across the project and that means you can be testing that deployment system and tweaking it across the two months as you're building it out for the client. Um, so you can still do a fair bit of it. Um, the, the issue with not having automated testing is you're probably going to miss stuff, but if you've got an automated deployment system so you can release more quickly, every time you break something, you can get the fix um, live faster. Um. Uh, it's, I think it's still worth using without automated testing, but your velocity will be faster with automated testing. I know there's a few other people who've got questions. I'm more than happy to talk to you more about this afterwards. Um, um, I, so there was a guy here. Yep. Yep. Um, I was just wondering, I just had a question about the Composer workflow aspect of it. So does the Composer workflow aspect replace the Drush up C process? And if so, why? No, and so it doesn't, um, well, I don't advocate using Drush update code. I think it, it replaces the makefile workflow. Um, makefiles are great, um, but they're a real Drupalism and you can't um, include non-Drupal dependencies through, well, you kind of can, but it's a hack. Um, like, you, whereas Composer, you can um, include all of your um, code dependencies. It's it's, I think it's a better option. Yeah, yeah this guy <laughs> up there. Okay, um, you can specify a min sorry, the question was can you specify the PHP version in composer.json? You can define um, a PHP dependency version in your composer.json. I'd recommend only specifying a minimum PHP version. Like if you know that um, something's completely busted with seven, then specify a range. But I would be recommending specify a minimum version. Um, and then use your um, <coughs> test suite to run with whichever target version or versions you want to use. Uh, other could we have uh, component uh, You want to use a composer.json file with a Drupal module? Yeah. 
Yes, everyone here who's working on Drupal modules, you should have a composer.json in the root directory of your module, um, putting in the basic information about the module, but also specifying any third party dependencies. Don't go putting libraries in your modules and also don't use the libraries module. It was great for Drupal 6. Um, that was many years ago. We're now doing Drupal 7. I mean Drupal 8. Some of us still get stuck doing Drupal 7 sometimes. Um, if that issue is not closed yet, we are not finalizing that issue, whether we need a composer.json. No, uh, the, the, the issue is about if you so must have one, yeah. or but there's no discussion about um, can you have one. So I, I, I say like the decision still to be made if they're going to be mandatory. So in the meantime, put one in there so if they do decide that it is going to be mandatory, you're not going to have to um, go back and do it. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. That was uh, C Vegans that put in like, uh, we don't need, it's not necessary at all. Yeah, um, I've, I've read through um, that issue. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, you know, any night I'm struggling to um, fall off to sleep, I go find the big long discussions yes. on Drupal.org. And you know you get about sixty comments in, and then it's just like had enough of that. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, any more questions? Yeah. Okay. So um, Docker is really good. Um, the reason why I didn't go into Docker today is I could have done a whole presentation on Docker. And one of the other issues with Docker that you get into is, do you want it for local? Do you want it for production? Do you want it for both? How do you do orchestration? Um, there's just so many um, possibilities with Docker. Um, I've been really excited about Docker um, for about three years now. And I think Docker is awesome, but I just, um, I can't do a 45 minute presentation on how to do um, Docker with Drupal at the moment. There's just too many options. Any more questions? Cool. Oh, yep. Could you elaborate a little bit on the platform SH uh, workflow? Uh, I saw that you were running Composer somewhere outside the VM. And then somehow got deployed into the VM? Uh, so um, platform.sh isn't a VM. It actually deployed it to the remote environment for me. So I updated my composer.json file locally. And I could have been running a VM locally as well. I just skipped that step for, for time. Um, but I could have um, updated my composer.json, um, run the um, platform client build, Locally, that would have run the build, and then I could have checked that locally, commit my changes, and then that gets deployed onto Platform SH. Okay, got you. Yep. Thank you. No worries. Um, the guys on the booth will be able to give you a lot more info about how it works. Actually, talk to that guy there if you want to know about Platform. Cool. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. And if you've got more questions, I'll be here today and I'll be around for part of tomorrow. So just grab me and we can chat. Oh, actually, no. One more thing. One more thing. I'll get in trouble um, from the DA and there's a board member here. So I need to tell you, um, go rate my session.